Extra, extra, read all about it. Jack the Ripper baffled Scotland Yard. 1888, Whitechapel, home to East London sex trade. A sinister shadow stalked its dark brooding alleys, brutally slaying a slew of so-called fallen women in a vicious spree over just a few streets. Fleeing unseen and leaving no clues, the mystery of Jack the Ripper's identity and motive fueled the burgeoning tabloid media baying for blood and print, making his killings as infamous today as they were back then. Jack the Ripper was the first spree killer of his kind, but he wasn't the last. Extra, extra, read all about it. Soho Strangler battles Scotland Yard. 1935, Soho. Almost 50 years later, and three miles west, an unseen slayer stalked the fog wreathed streets of West London's red light district. Four women, all poor, all foreign, all linked to the sex trade, and all unnervingly similar in life and looks, were strangled alone in their beds with escalating ferocity. Dubbed the Soho Strangler, this lone maniac terrified these few streets, leaving women in fear, the police at a loss, and with no witnesses or clues. Even today, all four murders remain unsolved. Syndicated worldwide, newspapers from London to Lisbon, Chicago to Karachi, fed off the fever of his killing spree. It made Soho a byword for terror, the strangler a sadist to be feared, and it bestowed a notoriety on his four unfortunate victims. French Fifi, Marie Cotton, Dutch Leia, and French Marie. The Soho Strangler was the Jack the Ripper of his era. But with the fascists on the rise, Nazi season power, and a real horror looming on the horizon, death would soon come not to a few, but to hundreds in Soho and millions across the world. And although both cases were strangely similar, one remained infamous as the other was entirely forgotten. Limitless books have tried to solve the riddle of the Ripper killings. But what stalls every investigation is the lack of evidence, as most of the documents were either lost, stolen, or inaccurately regurgitated by a tabloid press focused on speed and not accuracy. 135 years on, it's unlikely that the Ripper will ever be solved. And yet in the case of the Soho Strangler, we have everything. From court records to police files, autopsy reports, witness statements, coroner's inquests, and full histories of his victims and suspects. Told in full for the very first time, this is the true story of Britain's long-forgotten serial killer, the Soho Strangler. Archer Street, Soho, the seedy heart of the West End's theatre and sex trade, is a cramped little slit between Piccadilly Circus, Shaftesbury Avenue and Old Compton Street. Riddled with jazz joints, jizz parlours, pubs, clubs and brothels, 
It hummed with the sordid bristle and stench of booze and sex. Monday the 4th of November 1935, just shy of noon. Elderly French maid Felicity Placent strolled into 3 to 4 Archer Street. Passing the windmill, Soho's infamous burlesque club. The street door was unlocked as usual as she ascended the staircase. The Cairo Club in the basement and the Globe Club on the first floor was silent, except for the scrubbing of cleaners prepping for the late night trade. With the second floor currently vacant and the third and fourth floors sublet to four sex workers in four single flats. As a prostitute's maid, Felicity worked a 12 hour shift for a modest wage of one pound per week. Her job to make the bed, to wash the sheets, to empty the ashtray, to ensure the room was spick and span and to generally be invisible to any good or nervous clients, and yet visible to those who were bad. On the third floor, she unlocked the door to flat one, seeing no movement beyond its frosted glass. With the hall often silent at this hour, Felicity crept in as her employer 41-year-old French prostitute, Mrs. Josephine Martin, known as French Fifi, slept till mid-afternoon, having worked from 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. Nothing seemed out of place. The rug had rocked up, as it often did, when Madame opened the door. Several cigarette butts littered the ashtray, and a half-eaten meal of eggs and tea adorned the kitchen table. Pretty much, the flat was as she had left it 36 hours earlier. With no client seen, through a slightly ajar curtain, she saw Fifi alone on the bed, fully dressed and flaked out. As per usual, Felicity popped a kettle on the hob to make them both a cuppa for the long day ahead. Felicity would state, I took her to the bedroom. She was lying on her back with her feet on the floor and with one shoe and stocking off. I put the tea on the dressing table. I caught hold of her hand and shook it and said, Here's your tea, madam. Her hand was stiff and cold. I then realized she was dead. Having taken her own life, using her own stocking to seize her own breath, her passing marked the sad and tragic end to the turbulent life of a good woman who only wanted to be loved. Sickness, loss and depression had pockmarked her final years, only for her to succumb to a very lonely suicide. The death of French Fifi was as unremarkable as it was forgotten. Long before she hid behind her alias, French Fifi was born Josephine Mécanique on the 22nd of July, 1894, in Paris. The eldest of two siblings, with an older brother, Albert. Raised by Russian Jews in a French suburb, the family frequently moved to flee their persecution as immigrants. And given her chaotic upbringing, it was no surprise that wherever she fled to, Josephine was always desperate to find love. 
seen as softly spoken and sensitive. She was described as a good girl who kept her family well. A quiet soul who seldom spoke to anyone. And a woman who didn't just fall in love. She becomes besotted and will do anything for the person she adores. Being easy on the eye, Josephine was a petite and slightly plump brunette. With her hair in a bob, long fingernails and a set of ruby red lips. In 1901, for reasons unknown, seven-year-old Josephine was brought to England, leaving behind her mother, but followed one year later by 16-year-old Albert. Working alongside her tailor father in the French parts of Soho, she was educated and she knew the streets well, but her English would always be broken. Age 14, she returned to Paris. Only her true home would hold nothing but horror for this young girl. According to James Orr, a later lover of Josephine's, some man became acquainted with her. Being so besotted by him that she did as he bade, he put her on the streets. A little girl forced to sell her virginity to see these strangers in Rue Pigali, the dark and dangerous streets of Paris's red light district. Made pregnant by a man who pimped her out and ponced off her illegal earnings, her illegitimate child was born in secret, adopted under a false name, and she never saw her only child ever again. By the end of the First World War, and after four years of prostitution, Fifi moved back to London. Although it's uncertain if she fled, or she was trafficked by French pimps as part of the white slave trade. In September 1919, at Marleybone Registry Office, Barely months after her return to Soho, 24-year-old Josephine Mechanique married British citizen Henry V. Martin, a waiter at the nearby Trocadero. I wish I could tell you that she found love and lived happily ever after. But she didn't. It's likely that this was a marriage of convenience, possibly paid for by her pimps, so her newly established British citizenship would make it impossible to deport her for the crime she would commit to pay off her debts to her pimps. After just six months, Josephine and Henry split, and he promptly moved to America to start a new life for himself possibly funded by the small wage he was paid for an afternoon's work. She rarely spoke of him again, but having retained his surname and the wedding ring, this would gift her some respectability. That same year, being sick with loneliness, Josephine fell for César Mary, a serial philanderer who worked at the Belgian consulate in Belgravia. Wooing her with fine words and gifting her a good life of a nice flat, fancy furs and lavish cocktail parties. He fulfilled her dreams. So besotted was Josephine that on her right thigh she tattooed an unfortunate epitaph. It read, To my César, forever till I die. Only with his love a cruel sham, 
It's likely that his legitimate job was a ruse to hide his illicit affairs. And as was a familiar trick employed by the white slave traders, he gave her everything, only to take it away. Living in poverty, but fueled by the hope of a return to the good life, as French Fifi, Josephine would be forced to pay her way, owing an ever-escalating fee to her pimps, which she could never pay off. And yet, although little and quiet, Josephine had a fiery temper when things got a little too hot. In 1923, after three years living under César's rule, she packed up her belongings, moved in with her brother Albert, and doing something as brave as it was foolish. Following her arrest for prostitution, she appeared at Bow Street Police Court as witness for the prosecution against César. Found guilty of living off her immoral earnings, he was sentenced to one month's hard labour and as an illegal alien on the 6th of September 1927 he was deported back to Belgium later stating it was Fifi who put me away by 1927 after 17 years as a prostitute all French Fifi knew was sex. Shielded by a nom de plume, her alias gave a hint of the exotic to her working class punters, but it also shielded her truth in a mystery. As a well known and well liked figure in Soho's sex district, she plied her trade on Glasshow Street, a short thoroughfare from Piccadilly Circus to the eastern edge of Regent Street. She always dressed elegantly in fine furs, neat makeup, and discreet but affordable jewellery. She was always polite, often alone. But blessed with many friends who were prostitutes, they escorted one another for protection. Post César, it is unknown whether she had a pimp. But as Soho's prostitution rackets were run by a slew of foreign criminals, were the French pimps like Roger Vernon and the Marcel Collective, Red Max and the Iron Gang, or Maltese gangsters like the Messina Brothers and the Vassallo Gang. Until the day of her death, Josephine would amass 74 convictions for prostitution and brothel keeping. And yet that year would ignite a tragic downfall, which would end in her suicide. In 1928, bucked with cramps, bleeding and dizzy spells, 34-year-old Josephine was rushed to the Middlesex Hospital as cancer was spotted on her womb. Given an emergency hysterectomy which saved her life, although she remained under medical care, it would plague her with pains for the rest of her days. Her maid would state, Madam was always sick. Cursed with sharp pains in her back, hot flushes to her face, dysentery, fever, shortness of breath, and her blood pressure so low, she often passed out. Discharged after three months, she went straight back to work, all broken and withdrawn. On the 9th of November 1933, Josephine moved into flat one on the third floor of 3 to 4 Archer Street in Soho. A busy side street chock full of musicians, dancers and actors, as well as pubs and clubs supplying a passing trade of drunks with ready cash and raging bonus. 
split into a sitting room, a bedroom, a kitchen and a bathroom. Vera Richards, the landlady, liked her French tenant, and she always kept a spotlessly clean flat, and only once was she late with the two-pound rent. For Josephine, her professionalism was a matter of pride. Her dresses were stylish, her fur coats were neat, her makeup was subtle, and her stockings never had a rip nor a run. To her French maid, 72-year-old widow Felicity, she was always kind, caring, and never failed to pay her wage, even if she was short. By 1935, her last year alive, times were hard for Josephine. Described as tight with money and always sober. Whereas once this exquisite French beauty, with a doll-like frame, searing blue eyes and pouting red lips, had her pick of the ten or so clients a night that a sultry Parisian murmur lured in. Now, cracked, faded, and often bedridden for days on end, this middle-aged, lightly graying, slightly pudgy woman struggled to muster three drunks, at best four. According to Millie, a friend and a fellow sex worker, she didn't have a type. She slept with anyone. Chinese, even coloreds. And earning, if it was her own, an okay wage of four to six pounds per night, depending on the weather. She had no regular callers, and no one came back for a second time. As a teetotaler, her limited funds rarely covered her outgoings. With her looks as her moneymaker, although her long fingernails were always neat and painted, the dental plate of her false teeth was old and worn. She owed debts to her dressmaker. She hocked her furs, and except for a wedding band to Henry Martin, she had pawned all of her jewellery. The police report would state, there was no doubt that she was heavily in debt and living a hand-to-mouth existence. As of those debts that we know of, by the time of her death, she owed 106 pounds, four shillings and sixpence, roughly eight and a half thousand pounds today, just shy of the annual wage in 1935. But her debt wasn't down to a silly lady struggling to look pretty, as being a good girl who kept her family well. She supported her brother Albert and his wife for months and often bailed him out of prison when he needed her most. Always frugal, she wasn't a spender, a lush or a squanderer. It was compassion which was her curse. As fueled by a longing to be loved, she became besotted and would do anything for those she adored. In the summer of 1932, at the Lions Corner House Tea Room in Piccadilly, Josephine met 29-year-old James Orr, known as Jimmy, a car dealer from Chicago whose handsome looks had got him bit parts in the movies. What blossomed was love. Real love. To a good man who loved her back. And although her life as a convicted prostitute may have put some men off, Jimmy loved Josephine no matter what. It could have been something wonderful. Only Jimmy had a demon. Heroin. Cursed with the sickness of addiction. Although not a drug user herself, Josephine loved this man 
who was decent, kind. And through his struggle, she supported him through poverty, pain and torment to try and save his soul. All she ever wanted was to be loved. And yet once again, love would be denied her. By the autumn of 1935, as the nights drew longer and punters grew fewer, as a 41-year-old, slightly portly lady, with no savings, few family, a recurring sickness, a burden of debt, and unable to move on as she was still legally wed. After a quarter of a century in sex work, her tawdry little life was to be her lot. Felicity would state, I have not heard her threaten to commit suicide. But almost daily, she complained about things being none too good. I considered this a regular remark in conversation, as she was always fed up. On Friday the 18th of October 1935, two weeks before her death, Josephine appeared at Great Marlborough Street Police Station on her final charge of prostitution. As was easiest, she pleaded guilty and she paid the 40 shilling fine to the court's jailer, PC Frederick Pregnell. At her inquest, he would state, She seemed very depressed. She said, I'm fed up with this life. I've got a good mind to finish it. I'm sick of it all. Stuck in a vicious cycle of sickness, debt and loneliness. Her unremittingly empty life was hard, getting harder. And worse still, it was dangerous. For prostitutes, violence is an all too common part of daily life. One week before her last conviction for prostitution, Millie, her neighbour in flat two, would state, I heard a quarrel in her room and knocked on the wall. Later, Josephine admitted, I had a struggle with a foreigner who got hold of my throat. But for Millie, it was quite usual for Fifi to have rows with the men she brought home. She would demand more than the agreed price, refuse to undress, and she was always in a hurry to get the man out of her flat. It was said by many that she could handle herself when she had to. And too often, she had to. having been robbed and burgled more times than she could recall. She would never take her stocking off in front of a man, and very seldom dressed before him. Not just to speed up the sex, but she always kept her money in the heel of her left stocking, as witnessed by her maid and friends. Saturday the 2nd of November 1935 was her penultimate day alive. And with it came a tidal wave of emotions. Having seen and supported Jimmy every day for the last two years, as much as she would miss him for the next three months, she helped him get into Caldergott Hall, a home for inebriates and drug addicts. Without a quibble, she'd always paid his bills, made his meals, gifted him an allowance, and would sacrifice her own needs by sending him to get clean. 91 miles northwest in the Midlands town of Nuneaton. 
that day. She so wanted to kiss him and to wish him goodbye. But having already left his hotel, it was not to be. The night was cold and glum as a bitter wind whistled down Archer Street. But drizzle aside, between 9pm and 11pm, Fifi picked up three men, unseen by Felicity, and being quick and quiet, they only stayed for ten minutes. With the two pound five shillings she made being posted to Jimmy, and a two shilling tip for her maid. Having changed the sheets, and left the flat pretty much as she would find it 36 hours later. At roughly midnight, as Felicity exited the door, Vivi's last words to her were, Good night, I'll see you on Monday. At 12.30 a.m., she met Millie at the Continental Café on Shaftesbury Avenue and lamented the loss of her lover who was gone. At 1.15 a.m., she handed her brother six shillings, as she often did to keep him out of debt. And from 1.30 a.m. till 6 a.m., she stayed with her friend Frida, smoking cigarettes and eating pies. That night, they planned to meet up again. Only this would be the last sighting of French Fifi. At 5.30pm, Frida called Fifi's phone in the flat. She sounded happy and she said she'd see me later as they often escorted each other on their patches, Frida on Green Street and Fifi on Glasshouse Street. As agreed, Frida waited for her pal at their pre-planned place and time. Only oddly, Fifi never arrived. Interviewed days later, there were a few possible sightings of Fifi only the details cannot be verified. Between 9.15 and 10pm, Sidney Bloom, a Jewish seller of contraception to prostitutes in the West End, said he saw Fifi on her patch and get off with a client. At 9.20pm, Millie in flat 2 heard Fifi shout, I can't see the money. You haven't put it down. The couple briefly rowed, and the man left. At 2am, James Weller, a doorman at Max Club at 41 Great Windmill Street, a road west of Fifi's flat, said, She wanted to come in. I said no, as women can't come in unless escorted by a gentleman. They had a laugh, and she seemed normal, and then left. And seeing her turn left into Ham Yard, Beatrice, the owner of Old Friars Cafe at 16 Ham Yard, served her semi-regular customer a black coffee. According to Beatrice, she sat alone, her arms were folded, she spoke to no one, and I thought... She looked really tired. If those dates and times were right, at a little after 2am, one street east, Fifi entered 3-4 Archer Street. Only nobody saw her, and with the clubs closed and the tenants out, nobody heard her.
alerted by her mate, Felicity Placent. At 1.50pm, Divisional Detective Inspector John Edwards and Police Surgeon Charles Burney conducted an in-situ examination of the body and the scene. With every door and window locked and in good working order, there were no signs of a break-in. With no hint of a robbery, disturbance or a struggle, foul play was not suspected. And with a half-eaten meal for one, of fried eggs and a pot of tea on the kitchen table, it looked as if she had dined alone and went to bed. With the lights out and the curtains still partially drawn, even at night, the bedroom would have been lit by the street lamps outside and the flats opposite, revealing the cold dead body of Fifi on the bed. Lying on her back and fully clothed, as if she was merely dozing, her face was described as peaceful, like her pain had been taken away. As on the dresser, lay painful reminders of her sad little life. Post office receipts to fund Jimmy's recovery and a recent court summons for the crime of prostitution. Her hair was still tidy. Her clothes weren't disarranged. Her fingernails were unbroken. And as she only did when she was alone, she had removed a stocking from her left leg. She had unclipped it and carefully rolled it down, so it didn't have a tear, a rip, or a run. Keen to find peace, she wrapped it twice around her neck. She tied a half-hitch knot to take the load, and as she pulled it tight, her low blood pressure made her pass out, and the stocking stopped her breath. With rigor mortis delayed by sudden trauma, her time of death was established as eight to ten hours prior. And with no recent bruising, Dr. Burney concluded it was probably a case of suicide. Released by the coroner, Mr. Ingleby Oddy, four days later, her body was buried, her funeral paid for by a Jewish charity. By the evening, a few local papers reported the death by suicide of a Soho prostitute known as French Fifi. Only being hastily written by tabloid hacks, many were short and inaccurate, as if nobody cared. The suicide of French Fifi was as unremarkable as it was to be forgotten. And yet, it was the first fledgling killing of the Soho Strangler. <laughs> the suicide of French VV was a shock. but not shocking. There was no rush and no fuss, just sadness. Felicity would state, I made a cup of tea and took it to the bedroom. The door was half open. I saw Madame on her back with her feet on the floor and with one shoe and stocking off. I said, Madam, Here's your tea. I touched her hand. She was dead and cold. Descending to the Globe Club on the first floor. In broken English, Felicity stammered, Madam Dead. As hysterical as anyone who had found their friend of 15 years, deceased. 
seeing her distress. Charles Bull, the manager, Joseph Phillips, the doorkeeper, and Lance George, an actor, entered the bedroom of flat one on the third floor of three to four Archer Street and saw her body at peace on the bed. With Soho being a place synonymous with sex, the suicide of a prostitute was not an uncommon sight, given the stresses of their lives. Charles Bull alerted a constable. P.C. Hill secured the scene and summoned a doctor. Dr. Rhea Frith Street pronounced life as extinct, and as her cause of death had to be determined, a suicide was still a criminal offence. The CID of Vine Street were called in. With the investigation headed up by Divisional Detective Inspector John Edwards and Chief Superintendent Walter Hambrook. The crime scene was assessed methodically. The door to flat one was examined by a locksmith who determined there was no tampering, no damage and no signs of a break-in. The flat had three keys, one for Fifi, one for her maid and one for the landlady all of which were accounted for, with Fifi's found in a handbag in the bedroom. With the light switches to the hallway in the bedroom in the on position, a shilling in the meter, but both light bulbs off, it was assumed she had died with the lights on, only for the money to run out. As a spotlessly clean flat, it was clear what had been touched since the maid had left 36 hours prior. The ashtray contained several stubs of spent cigarettes of different brands belonging to herself and the men she may have entertained that night, as well as one plate, one knife, one fork and one cup, all used for a last meal before bed, with an oily pan on the hob and a pot of tea on the kitchen table half drunk and cold. Found days later, witnesses came forward and pieced together her last known possible movements. A chat with the doorman at Max Club on Great Windmill Street at 2am and a black coffee at the Old Friars Cafe in Ham Yard before she left and headed one street east to Archer Street. Both witnesses confirm she was alone and she seemed a little lonely. But she didn't seem harassed and no one was following her. Speaking to her friends, no one recalled anything suspicious in the days prior. No threats, no stalking and no unusual levels of assault for this struggling sex worker with debts to several local businesses. Speaking to the building's tenants proved equally as fruitless. As with both clubs, the Globe and the Cairo closed. The communal street door was locked at midnight. The second floor was vacant and the fourth floor flats were uninhabited. All the police could rely on was the account of Millie Warren her neighbour in flat two. At 1am, I passed her door, Minnie would state, and I noticed her hall light was on. This was unusual. I shouted to her, but I got no reply. At 2am, in a taxi, I came back with a friend, William Charles Hill, known as John Cow. He spent the night. We stayed up until about 4.30 a.m. and we heard nothing. In the bedroom, there were no signs of disturbance. Her coat was on the chair. Her drawers were shut. Her ornaments were on the dresser. Her wireless radio was where it sat, as determined by the slight bleaching of sunlight and the curtains were open 
roughly 12 inches, meaning that at the time of her death, her bed and her body was illuminated by either a single bulb above or the streetlights on a time circuit. Had this been an assault, a sense of panic and fear would have pervaded the room. But it was entirely calm. Her body was positioned as expected, as having sat on the bed's edge to remove her stocking. She had tied it about her neck and fallen backwards, leaving her feet on the floor and her head on the pillow. Her clothes were neat and undisturbed. Her brown tweed skirt still fastened with a safety pin. Her underwear blue silk cami knickers, a pair of woolen knickers and a white woolen vest hadn't been interfered with. And off her white linen and satin suspender belt was a fake silk stocking on her right leg. As off her left leg, a stocking had been unclipped and carefully rolled down without a tear, run or rip. As she had then placed her blue cord shoe under the bed tied twice about her neck. Those who found her body didn't see the stocking as it was concealed by a grey woolen jumper. As seen in traumatic deaths, often the deceased dies with their last expression etched on their face, a hint of shock, fear or tears. Whereas Fifi's face was the epitome of peace, like her pain had been erased. By the night's end, she looked as she had at the start. Her lips rouged red, her eyelids brushed black, her short round bob kept in place with a set of Kirby grips, and her claw-like fingernails unbroken. With no suicide note found, her mood was determined by the detritus of worry which littered her bedside dresser. Post office receipts to send her lover Jimmy a few pounds to aid his recovery from heroin addiction. And her final fine and court summons for the crime of prostitution. At 1.50pm, Divisional Police Surgeon Charles Burney undertook a preliminary examination of the body in situ ensuring it was neither touched nor moved to preserve any evidence, no matter how small. The stocking was tied about her neck using a half-hitch knot. A common but carefully considered load-bearing knot, which, once she had started to lose consciousness, which would have occurred early given her low blood pressure, she would need a knot which retained its position as her hands and body went limp. Dr. Burney would state that with a few of her hairs and her grey jumper's tassel tangled within, it is possible that it was caught up in the knot while she was standing or sitting. It was tied by a right-hander. Fifi was right-handed and she died clutching the stocking in her right hand. Initially, her cause of death was most likely asphyxia. She had been dead for 8 to 10 hours, putting her time of death at between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m., although rigor mortis is delayed in cases of sudden death. And when asked for a suspected motive, Dr. Burney would state, it was probably a case of suicide. But when asked how certain he was, he would state, it was 50-50. At 6pm, 
as the body of Josephine Martin was moved to Westminster Mortuary. The press had begun sniffing about the death for a prostitute in the seedy underbelly of the West End. Extra, extra, read all about it. Italy's big push in Abyssinia. Was the headline in the Daily Telegraph as the Second Italio-Ethiopian War raged on. With a British election looming, the evening standard went with New MPs announced! And as the tabloid motto is If it bleeds, it leads, the press was salivating over the grisly murders of Dr. Buck Ruxton, a murder so savage that having mutilated their bodies into so many pieces, the press had dubbed him the Savage Surgeon and his crimes as the Jigsaw Murders. The death of French Fifi was deemed so unimportant that the small articles reporting the case were deeply hidden in the newspapers and they would have been binned had it not been a slow news day. Keen to play up the salacious angles, the press slathered over any fact to make this dull story drip with intrigue. That she was French, unmarried, and a prostitute. They drooled over every detail about the stocking, the flat, and her habits. And they even added their own flourishes, like artificial respiration was tried in vain, which was untrue. They did anything to make it exciting, as suicides don't sell newspapers. In the Daily Herald, dated the 5th of November 1935, it read, Woman's Death Mystery in West End Flat, Strangled by her own stocking. Scotland Yard officers investigating the death mystery of a woman in the Soho flat had not ruled out the possibility that she had been murdered. The autopsy to determine a cause of death was still taking place. And yet this detail was enough of a seed to plant a hint of a mystery of a possible murder. With the public only able to get their facts from newspapers, by the time the witnesses to Fifi's last sightings were unearthed, their information had already been sullied by what they had read. Interviewed days after her death, the doorman and the cafe owner were deemed reliable witnesses, although it couldn't be determined if they had actually seen her on the night of her death or hours or days prior. Witness statements are notoriously flawed, often being riddled with elaboration, confusion, fibs, false facts and downright lies, as everybody has their own reason to aid an investigation. Some may be good Samaritans, simply keen to do what is right, whereas others are in it for fame, spite or personal gain. Head waiter at the Criterion restaurant in Piccadilly Circus stated he saw French Fifi with two women in the grill room at 3.30 a.m. This turned out to be an entirely different French brunette, as by that point she was already dead. Taxi driver Charles Branch confirmed in his logbook that at 1.30 a.m. in the night in question, he picked up a small woman from 3 to 4 Archer Street, drove her to Caledonian Road near King's Cross, where she waited for a man. He drove them both back to her address, and they both entered via the street door. He later stated, Owing to her mannerisms, it struck me at the time that something was wrong. 
the police would determine that she had climbed the stairs to the third floor and entered her flat with the man. Only this woman was Millie Warren, her neighbor, and the man was Millie's friend, William Charles Hill. And then there was Sidney Bloom, a Jewish seller of contraception to prostitutes in the West End, who had volunteered information that between 9.15 p.m. and 10 p.m. he had seen Fifi on Glasshouse Street with a man. But being described as an incorrigible rogue with nine convictions for larceny, he had offered his assistance to the police, having first informed them of his own impending trial. A tit-for-tat scam he had done several times prior. Discounting his sighting, Sidney Bloom was later sentenced to four months' hard labour. On Tuesday the 5th of November 1935, at 11.30am, the autopsy began at Westminster Mortuary, conducted by Home Office pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury, in the presence of the police surgeon Dr Charles Burney, and Divisional Detective Inspector John Edwards. In it, the following was agreed. Time of death. Difficult to determine as the heating was meter powered and the window was partially open, making the room temperature inconsistent. The body was rigid and putrefactive gases were felt beneath the skin. Therefore, this would place a time of death nearer to the hours of 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. The deceased was healthy, with no natural disease to account for her death. She was small and often sickly, but she was well developed and could have put up a good resistance to an attack. With no torn clothing, no bruises to her thighs, and no semen inside her vagina. There was no indication of any recent act of sexual intercourse or any attempt at the time of her death. Some recent and old bruises, but nothing within the last day. But later found, hidden amongst the purple swelling of her neck, was a fresh bruise to her left jaw. Although given the abuse that prostitutes often endure, the police would later state, try and find a West End prostitute who doesn't have bruises to her face and neck. In her kitchen, she had made a last meal for one, but with her stomach only containing a brown liquid, most likely tea, and tomato or apple skin not found in the flat. With no trace of a fried egg in her gastric juices, either she had eaten them earlier that night, or someone else had eaten the eggs. Both doctors confirmed that her cause of death was asphyxia by strangulation. As her larynx was crushed, her tongue was swollen, her eyes protruded from their sockets, and she had wet herself. But Sir Bernard would query, if she had died by ligature strangulation, I would have expected to see more lividity. Her face was at peace when she died. But he would state, that is no guide as to whether it was murder or suicide. Having been photographed, the stocking was removed and sent to the laboratory. Twisted taut, bound twice, and tied tightly about her neck. The stocking had been fastened with a half-hitched knot under her right ear, suggesting it had been secured by a right-handed person, like Fifi. And although the suddenness of her unconsciousness could account for the lack of scratches or struggle. Sir Bernard would comment, 
She had either died or was at the point of death when the ligature was tied. After the hand was removed from the neck, she gave a gasp or two. The bloodstained mucus in the airways was then inhaled. Vomit got into the airway and the stocking was passed around her neck twice, tied in a half hitch and held for a while. When found, the ligature was tight and secure. Of that, Sir Bernard would quip, I have never known a woman to strangle herself with her own hand. Partially obscured by the stocking and its ensuing swollen wounds, bruises were later observed. Four fingers to the right of the neck and a thumb mark to the left. Being larger than her own, their origin was impossible to date for a prostitute who had recently been attacked by a foreigner who had got hold of her throat. At the back of her bloodstained mouth, having bitten her tongue, her dental plate of four teeth mounted on vulcanite was found shattered into three pieces. Possibly linked to the bruise on her jaw, Sir Bernard would state, in my opinion, the breaking of the dental plate is indicative of murder. And with hemorrhages in the bladder, intestines and rectum, it was clear a knee had been pressed hard on her abdomen. With so many variables, like whether her injuries were the result of two different assaults on the same or separate nights, an assault which led to her suicide, or an attack which led to her murder. Although Dr. Spilsbury was emphatic, this was a homicide. Dr. Burney was torn, as this still could be a suicide. The two experts would debate this for the next three weeks, leaving Detective Inspector Edwards to conclude his report of the 9th of November 1935, as the whole circumstances of the case are mysterious. The police needed time to compile the evidence to find the truth. They had several possible suspects. Henry V. Martin, her ex-husband by a possible marriage of convenience, was later traced to America, having not seen her for more than a decade. Albert Mechanique, her brother, had an alibi for the night of her death, and although dubbed a common criminal who was always in debt, it made no sense for Albert to murder his sister as she had financially been supporting him for the last few months. As for her lovers, Cesar Mary was in Brussels at the time of the murder, and although he had stated, it was French Fifi who put me away, he was neither angry, upset, and even after his deportation, he had never made any threats against her. As for Jimmy Orr, he had arrived at Caldicott Hall in Nuneaton two days earlier to begin his drug detox. And as confirmed by his doctors, he didn't leave the premises until he was made aware of her death. With no regular clients and those she was in debt to being friends, the police interviewed hundreds of witnesses, suspects and anyone with a history of violence against prostitutes but they came up blank. The public fed them their suspicions, usually ex-lovers and former friends, in the hope of getting them into trouble, as well as the usual bigoted band of society's villains 
who were blamed for everything, simply because they were different. Such as foreigners, gays, Jews, bohemians, the insane and the disabled. With nothing new to say, the police went quiet. And with nothing new to report, the press went into overdrive. Sixth of November, the Daily Herald. Silt stocking riddle baffles police. Nearly two days after the discovery of the body, Scotland Yard are unable to state how she died. Acquaintances of French Fifi told us they had always feared that sooner or later she would be killed by some man. The source of that quote was never found, and by that point her death was still listed as a suicide. The Herald incorrectly wrote, Detectives believe that robbery was the motive. Friends declare Fifi had large sums of money in her flat, which was untrue, as she was broke and only one P was found. The Evening Standard also declared nine pound gone from stocking of dead woman. And although her friends would confirm, she kept her money in the heel of her left stocking. It is impossible to say how much she earned or what had happened to it, whether it was spent, stolen, sent to Jimmy and subsequently lost. Or as the police suspected, it is possible that it may have been stolen by those who had found her body, most of whom were criminals. Awaiting the outcome of the autopsy, the press wrote about plain-clothed officers patrolling Soho, suspicious men being followed, and unverified quotes by mystery sources about imminent arrests. But as the days of radio silence turned into weeks with no solid facts, the press needed to find a fresh angle to keep their readers interested, some of which was born out of a tiny nugget of truth. The press had already decided two things. One, that she had been murdered. And two, as the police intensified their search of scores of cafes and nightclubs in the West End, in an intensive combing of the underworld, that a murderer must be local, working class, possibly foreign, and a known criminal. One day after her death, the Daily Herald declared, We understand that the woman was believed to have given evidence, which, this year, had led to a sensational court case. Of course, there was no record of that court case, no mention of it in her police files, and not one single newspaper reported this sensational court case in the months prior to her death. But if you print it, the people will believe it to be fact. On the 27th of November 1935, the people stated, Death of French Fifi baffles Scotland Yard. Was she the victim of a gang of white slavers? Some believe she made statements which led to their arrests. Now this was true with César Mary, but as a French prostitute, there was no known evidence that she was ever trafficked. On the 1st of December 1935, the Sunday pictorial, a sleazy tabloid rack raised the stakes, stating, French Fifi was a white slaver, murdered by gang because she knew too much which there was no proof of. But given the fact that she was already dead, they could print whatever they liked, even if it was entirely false. The article read, 
French Fifi had an amazing career in the underworld, which the police are now fully aware. This was a lie. She is said to have been an agent of a gang of white slave traffickers. She wasn't. For months, Scotland Yard has been waging war on marriages of convenience. This was true, although her only known link was her suspiciously short marriage. And some days before French Fifi was found murdered, a Scotland Yard inspector called to see her to obtain information about gang members. The gang had communicated with her as letters from one of its members were found in her flat. French Fifi had undoubtedly paid the penalty for knowing too much. And yet, not a single shred of what was written could be proven. For simple-minded readers of such tabloid trash, who couldn't comprehend that a newspaper's role is as much to inform as it is to entertain. A basic fact had entirely passed them by. If Fifi was a white slaver, why was she so poor? Why did she work alone? And why did she still sell her body for sex? After three weeks of deliberation, Sir Bernard Spilsbury and Dr. Charles Burney resolved their findings into the autopsy of Josephine Martin, alias French Fifi. Reopened on Tuesday the 26th of November 1935 at 2pm, the inquest into her death was held at Westminster Coroner's Court. With several witnesses giving evidence, including her friends, Frida Martin, Clara Bennett and Lily Hayes, her neighbour Millicent Warren and Home Office pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury. The inquest was concluded the same day, with the coroner declaring her death was willful murder by person or persons unknown. Although the pathologist would state this is a likelihood of probability, not a cast iron fact. With no suspects to be questioned, and no eyewitnesses to her murder, both the investigation and the inquest were closed. Just like Jack the Ripper, three miles east and almost 50 years earlier, the murderer of French Fifi had fled unseen, leaving no clues as to his motive or his identity. Having vanished into thin air, it was as if he didn't exist. And with this death, initially mistaken for a suicide, no one knew that this was the first fledgling killing by a serial killer who had stalked the sex workers of West London's Red Light District. By 1935, the Soho Strangler was nothing, being barely a whisper on the breeze. But with his killing spree just beginning, soon this man would become a monster. A sadistic slayer who would unleash terror onto the streets, making him as infamous in his day as Jack the Ripper. And then be forgotten. Part 3 of The Soho Strangler continues next week. The Whitechapel murders occurred during a perfect storm of immigration, education, and the birth of tabloid news. No longer the domain of the elite, newspapers thrived and died.
by its salacious tales in easily digestible nuggets to feed the feverish hunger of the semi-literate masses of the working classes. The Mysterious Slaughter of Fallen Women by a sadistic so-called moral guardian was the perfect story. Serialized over several weeks and syndicated across the world, with growing gore and depravity, the crimes of Jack the Ripper grabbed the headlines for weeks and our attention for the next century. Reveling in exploitative prose, crude sketches of ripped whores, and each wound emblazoned in bold. The penny papers cared not a whit about the victims or the accuracy of its words, as all that mattered was the sale of the papers and the lifespan of the story, as the mystery over the murderer remained. By the 1930s, Newspapers were no longer society's sole source of information and entertainment, as owing to an explosion of cinema, theatre, radio and television on the cusp of broadcasting, the public had their fill of murder, with some killers becoming household names and others consigned to the side columns. As with the Blackout Ripper, the Soho Strangler was a mysterious series of killings which caused terror in Soho's red light district as a sadist stalked four unnervingly similar women across neighbouring streets leaving no witnesses no clues no motive and no hint to his identity having selected his victim he would choose his method his moment and having murdered in silence, he would vanish without a trace. Not one for ego. He didn't kill for money, for fame, for sex, or even anger. As this killer spun the public a sinister mystery in the murder of French Fifi, which was mistaken for a suicide. Told for the very first time, this is the true story of Britain's long-forgotten serial killer, the Soho Strangler. Five months since the death of French Fifi, this sad tale of one of life's unloved was almost forgotten. Life went on, and with her inquest closed and her body buried, all that remained was her name. Two streets north of Archer Street stood Lexington Street, a thin cobblestone thoroughfare between the busy markets of Broadwick Street and Brewer Street flanked by British pubs and continental cafes. Lined with four-storey terraces, the ground floors were occupied by small shops, such as butchers, bakers or pawnbrokers, and accessed by street doors and ascended by communal staircases. Each floor was often sublet into lodgings for short-term tenants and trades like tailors, cobblers and dressmakers. On Thursday the 16th of April 1936, at 8.45pm, having finished his shift as a pastry chef at San Marco restaurant, 18-year-old Remo Lanza arrived home. With dusk set and this desolate street lit only by two lamps on opposing corners, 47 Lexington Street was in near darkness. On the ground floor, a Jewish barber's was shut. On the first floor, the German seamstress was away. At the top floor, a sewing machine thrummed 
as Italian tailor Mr. Gibelli worked late. And in the second floor front flat, Dorothy Neary, a British-born prostitute, was out. Through the unlocked street door, Remo ascended the silent staircase to the second floor, where the two back rooms, a bedroom and a kitchen, were shared by Remo, his father Carlo, and his stepmother-to-be, a 43-year-old French cleaner called Jean-Marie Cotton, who he affectionately called Auntie. With her tiny flat, only accessible by a single door to the kitchen, Remo would state, I found the door was locked. There were three keys, of which they each had one, but hers was missing. Remo assumed his auntie wasn't in, which was odd, as there was no light on, only a little from the kitchen window. With the gas light off, and a cloth over the window's lower half, to provide a little privacy from the neighbours behind, the kitchen was dark. He called out, Auntie, but got no reply. With the shilling still in the meter, he lit the gas lamp and spite of the room was spotlessly clean. With dusters on the side, a bucket of soapy water and a pile of folded linen fresh from the clothes horse. It looked as it had when he had left that morning. Only two details stood out. As a wooden chair had been knocked onto its side and lying face down on the floor, all silent and still, was Auntie. I said, aren't you going to get up? But she did not answer. As a sickly woman, prone to nerves and bouts of depression, it didn't strike him as strange. So he corrected the chair and entered the bedroom. There was no one there, not an object out of place, and there was nothing to suggest any wrongdoing. As he re-entered the kitchen, Remo knew that something was wrong. I could see that Auntie's hands were red and blue, and when I touched them, they felt cold. With no obvious signs of a robbery, an assault, nor a struggle, it seemed as if an exhausted woman had collapsed and died in the midst of her chores. The death of Marie Cotton would be as unremarkable as it was forgotten. And yet, unbeknownst to the world, the Soho Strangler had struck again. It could be a coincidence, but there are unnerving similarities between Marie Cotton and French Fifi. Jean-Marie Cotton was born on the 30th of December 1892 in saint brieuc a city in the Côte d'Amour region of Brittany in northwest France. Little is known of her upbringing, except that as a young girl, she was raised in Paris under the shadow of the newly built Eiffel Tower. With a press prone to demonize any victim who didn't match up to the moral ideals of the decade, as if being unworthy of living, that their death was fated. Marie, as she was known, was branded the divisor of her own demise before her body was even cold. Listed in newspapers as French, unmarried and bohemian, none of which was a social plus in 1930s Britain, 
they referenced her aliases as if she was a criminal. Many listed her differently. Marie Cotton, also known as Jeanette Cousins, or Mrs. Lanza, alias Jean-Marie Cousins. Whereas none were sinister, with all being due to honest changes in her circumstance. Jean-Marie Cotton was her birth name. In Britain, she had adopted the anglicized version of Jeanette to blend in. She married a man called Cousins and took his surname. And to hide the fact that she later lived in sin with an Italian cook. Until they could marry, this widow was known locally as Mrs. Lanza. Like French Fifi, who she had neither met nor known, Marie was an early 40s French brunette, equally as short, being barely five foot one. And although sickly, she was physically sturdy and solid. In 1920, the same year that Fifi and Henry's six-month marriage ended, 28-year-old Marie came to the UK. And on the 2nd of January 1924, in Dartford, she married 47-year-old British citizen, Lewis Cousins. It lasted for just 14 months. She was granted British citizenship and a passport. And even after his death in 1929, she rarely spoke of him. It is uncertain if this was misplaced love or a marriage of convenience. Like Fifi, she was a quiet woman with few friends. She kept to herself and she rarely drank. Although intensely private, she would later open up to Dorothy, her lodger, who would state... Jeanette was a very unhappy woman and always complaining about her treatment by other people. She was frequently depressed and on many occasions she had said to me that she would be better off dead than alive. On a superficial level both women were very similar. But that is where the similarities would end. Some newspapers have mistakenly called her French Marie, as if to imply a link to the sex trade based on her gender and nationality. But she had no criminal record. And in the police report, she is described as a woman of good character. There was no evidence that she had, at any time, been a prostitute. Marie Cotton was an ordinary woman living an unremarkable life. But what attracted the Soho Strangler to her? Recently widowed. By August 1930, Marie was an out-of-work waitress struggling to afford a cramped lodging on Shaftesbury Avenue, where she met Carlo Lanza, an Italian cook at the Florence restaurant on Rupert Street. In what could easily be seen as a whirlwind romance, as much as it was a necessity for the poor, after four weeks they moved in together to a room at 14 Old Compton Street in Soho. Working long shifts. In January 1931, they moved into a three-roomed flat at 47 Lexington Street, with Remo, fresh from Italy, sleeping on a bunk in the kitchen, as the front room was sublet to lodgers. Carlo would state, We got on well. But with money tight, the short fuse of this fiery little chef was prone to snap. Statements vary. Remo said, They quarreled sometimes, but nothing serious. Dorothy said, They didn't get on well, having frequent arguments in a language she didn't understand. And yet Josephine Poulacan, a friend of Marie's, would confess, 
they were always fighting. I have often seen Madame Cotton with bruises and black eyes. I knew she was afraid to leave Lanza, as being riddled with jealousy. He had threatened to kill her if she ever left him for another man. Like Fifi, as a woman eager to be loved and finding none at home, Marie's eyes wandered. Dorothy would state, she used to speak of her sweetheart, an Italian chef from Peter Street called Dintis, who she loved and kept his photo in her purse. But having loaned him money, her lover had long since fled. With no family, few friends, and no savings, Marie was a lone woman, stuck in an abusive relationship. Josephine stated, Lanza never gave her money, except when he had sex with her. She used to complain about him being lustful. He frequently wakened her up in the middle of the night. When she refused, he accused her of having a ponce. Only Madame Cotton was not a prostitute. She was too ill to be a prostitute and too poorly dressed. With no police reports to back this up, and Marie deceased, it's impossible to verify where the truth stops and the lies begin, as every witness has a vested interest to make the statements that they make. Just like three to four Archer Street, 47 Lexington Street was a busy little thoroughfare where any stranger could pass unnoticed. Being badly lit and riddled with a rabbit's warren of side streets to scuttle down, alleys to escape unseen and doorways which sink into the darkness, Soho can be a haven for the anonymous. With the street door off a bustling pavement, and open all day till the workers left, anyone could nip in unnoticed, ascend the unlit stairs, and silently enter a lodging to do their dirty deed in private. Only those who knew Marie would state, when she was in her flat, she never locked the door. 47 Lexington Street was where Marie felt safe. With the busy barbers below, tradespeople about all day, and her lodger on the other side of a petition wall. Unlike silence, noise can be reassuring. But living in a city where screams go unheard, the sound of the dying can be drowned out by the flurry of the living. On the 16th of November 1935, a new lodger moved in. Ruddy cheat and dressed like a dandy, 28-year-old James Allen Hall was a clerk at Denard Manufacturing in Margaret Street. Paying one pound and seven shillings a week, including the cleaning of the room and the washing of the bed sheets. He paid on time, he was no bother, and he didn't cause any friction between Carlo and Marie, as although handsome, James was gay. Sharing a bed with his boyfriend, 18-year-old Donald Ross, being a moral woman, Marie didn't like the things that they did. But as she needed the money, she was fine with it, as long as they kept it to themselves. Sadly, owing to a minor squabble over a sold mattress. On the 30th of January 1936, James moved out. But that same day, Dorothy Neary moved in, meaning Marie didn't lose any income from the loss of rent. 
She liked Dorothy. They often chatted over a nice cuppa, and she trusted her enough to let her into her heart. As a 30-year-old single woman living apart from her husband, Dorothy claimed she was a kept woman by several men who adored her, being young, blonde, and pretty. In truth, she was also a Soho prostitute who picked up punters in Hyde Park and brought them back to her room for discreet but silent sex. She disliked lying to Marie as her landlady was decent. Later stating, Jeanette didn't lead an immoral life and she was not aware of how I got my living. So blessed with a partition wall three inches thick, when Dorothy invited her boyfriends over, she popped on the radio to lessen the noise. In her final weeks of life, Dorothy proved an invaluable companion to Marie. As although unaware of the Soho Strangler, she was in fear for her life. On Thursday the 9th of April, having been to Great Marble Street Police Court to apply for a summons, Marie asked Dorothy to escort her to the Astoria Cinema on Charing Cross Road. She was frightened. She asked me to wait in the queue with her, as she was visibly shaken and terrified of a man who she knew from her unspoken past, who was back. Dorothy confirmed, he is a Jew. I know him only as Mr. Cohen. We know nothing about Mr. Cohen, who he was, where he lived, what he looked like, and as a quiet woman who rarely spoke about her fears, we have no idea what connected them or why she was so scared. Dorothy said, she called him my Jew man, stating he had once helped her out in the past but now he was broke and was calling in debts, with a few pounds, shillings or pence. Being afraid of Mr. Cohen's retribution, Dorothy would state, she asked me to stay in during the evenings for protection, and together they devised a code. If the Jew man came to see her and she became frightened, she would drop something in the kitchen and then I'd go in and see her. Jean-Marie Cotton was an enigma, an unremarkable woman with a mystery in her past. She was a moralist who let her room to prostitutes and homosexuals, a lady of no known criminality who owed untold monies to a violent man, and seen as little more than an inoffensive little French brunette who worked part-time as a cleaner. Bafflingly, she was enduring stresses and threats on all sides of her life. But why? Was she hiding a secret, running from the truth, or was she spinning a lie? Thursday the 16th of April 1936 was as ordinary a day as most for the terrified Marie Cotton. At 7am she awoke and dressed in a mishmash of old clothes, a red jumper, a spotty blue dress, a pink coat, black shoes, black stockings, and while cleaning, a floral overall and a silk handkerchief, which she wore as a headscarf. At 8am, 
Remo left for work at the San Marco restaurant in Mayfair, bidding her good morning, auntie. As at 9am, Carlo headed to his work as a cook for a full day's shift. Between 8am and 1pm, she cleaned the home of Mr. Prenter, a barrister at 12A Savile Row. She worked alone. She saw no one. She had no worries. And having let herself out, she arrived home at 1.15pm. According to Dorothy, at 1.20pm, she came into my room. She was complaining about the woman she was working for. Apart from that, she was quite normal. She mentioned nothing about the Jew. At 3.10pm, Carlo returned home as his lunch shift was over. As Marie was making the bed, I lit a fire in the kitchen. And as she sewed, he read the paper, discussing the raging war in Abyssinia. At 4.50pm, having shaved, he left, leaving the key inside of the locked door and headed to his job, just off Archer Street. At 5pm, Dorothy and Marie had a chat and a cup of tea, in which Marie grumbled about Carlo's dirty ways. Marie continued cleaning the tidy kitchen and doing the laundry as Dorothy ran herself a bath. That was the last sighting of Marie Cotton alive. At 5.15pm, as habit, Dorothy popped on a wireless radio. I did this whilst I was washing myself and all the time my friend was in the room. That night, Dorothy had planned to see Brahman Alban, one of the several men who kept her, a phrase she used to disguise the fact that she was a prostitute. From 6.15pm, Brahman waited on the opposite side of Lexington Street, facing Dorothy's window. I waited for her to open the curtains, a sign that it was safe. And at 6.35pm, she ushered me up by the street door. They stayed in her room, making love with the radio on. And according to Dorothy, I heard no unusual noises nor did I hear anyone enter or leave the flat. In the police report, Brahman Alban of Bow was described as 35 years old, 5 foot 4, clean shaven, dark haired, in a dark suit, a bowler hat and a heavy overcoat. And firmly underlined, it states, he is a Jew. At 7.30 p.m., with the sex over, the radio off, and Brahman having departed, Dorothy went to Marie's door. I knocked, but I received no answer. I thought she was out. Only she wasn't. She was dead. At 9.30pm, Dr. V.F. Morkos of Dean Street certified her life as extinct. PCs Horner and Brown secured the scene and with CID notified, Chief Inspector Sharp, Divisional Detective Inspector Burt, and Police Surgeon 
Dr. Charles Burney arrived. The same doctor who had attended the death of French Fifi. As before, the crime scene was assessed methodically. As the only entrance to the flat, the door showed no signs of a break-in. It had been locked from the outside, and of the three keys, Marie's was found at the foot of the first flight of stairs. The gas light was off, but with money in the meter, someone had extinguished the light before they had left. In the bedroom, only accessible via the kitchen, the wardrobes and drawers were untouched. Nothing was missing or disarranged, and the police report stated, everything appeared to be in order, except there were two indentations on the side of the bed, consistent with two persons having been seated. And on the floor, close to the bed, was a quantity of cigarette ash. The kitchen was equally as orderly, with a set of dusters, a bucket of water, and a pile of freshly clean clothes, as Marie may have left them. Found face down on the floor, lay Marie. Her time of death, somewhere between 5.30pm and 7.30pm. Like French Fifi, there were no witnesses, no fingerprints, and nothing to connect anyone with the crime. It was a brazen, motiveless assault in a well-lit room with open curtains and neighbours nearby. Likewise, Marie's death was initially confused with a different motive. As with Fifi strangled by her own stocking, which was hidden by a jumper, Marie was strangled using her own scarf, but being tied with a less reliable granny knot rather than a half hitch, it had slipped up and over her chin. Unlike Fifi's, this crime scene had a hint of a struggle, as this time an instantaneous death was less forthcoming. As her clothes were disarranged, but not sexually, with her dress and apron rocked up and her knickers pulled down. The waistband had lost its elasticity as someone had sat astride her. With a bruise to her nose and her right eyebrow, she had been struck, but not being knocked unconscious, she had fallen to the floor, leaving a small pool of blood by her nose, which someone had tried to wipe up. With her cause of death listed, as Fifi's was, as death by ligature asphyxiation. This time, there was no confusion after the in-situ examination. Dr. Burney would state, She died of strangulation, and the scarf had not been tied by accident, or by her own act. And therefore, must have been tied by someone else. Backed up by a full autopsy, Dr. Burney would confirm that Marie Cotton had been murdered. The police would conduct a thorough investigation, but with no motive, no witnesses, very few clues, and only a handful of possible suspects but no one who stood out as undoubtedly her killer. Again, they would conclude, the case is a complete mystery. And although there were connections between the two murders of two small French brunettes on neighboring streets within a few months of each other, the police were hesitant to make such a bold leap without cold hard facts. Where was the press? were not. 
by the morning. The press had already stated, The murder bears similarities to the death of another Soho woman, Mrs. Josephine Martin, known as French Fifi, who was found strangled with a silk stocking in her flat last November. Concluding the article, it has been suggested that they may be connected. And although Chief Inspector Sharp would later rebuke, it has been stated in the press that the deceased was associated with French Fifi and other notorious undesirables of French origin and that she was murdered because she knew too much. There is not an atom of truth in the reports which are libelous and false in their entirety. But still, the theories had begun and soon a myth would be formed. Delayed for three months, the inquest into the murder of Marie Cotton brought forth from the shadows the police's prime suspect. A man with method and motive who had an overwhelming reason to kill. Until now, no one suspected that there was a serial killer in their midst. And having failed to piece together the clues, the Soho Strangler would remain just a whisper. Part 4 of The Soho Strangler continues next week. The morning of Friday the 17th of April 1936 was deathly still as a damp fog hung. Drenched in sombre silence, a small crowd bowed their heads as down the staircase and through the street door of 47 Lexington Street, two men in mournful suits carried a black wooden coffin into the back of a black waiting van. Word had quickly spread across Soho that Jean-Marie Cotton had been murdered. Strangled in her own flat with her own scarf in a motiveless attack by an unknown killer. Fueling the fire. That day, Marie's murder was headline news in many national newspapers. Hastily recycling any salacious tidbits, whether fact or false, to get the scoop. Many like the Daily Mail and the Leicester Evening Mail both went with Beautiful Woman Murdered in Soho. As it's faster and cheaper to copy and paste from a press release than it is to dispatch a reporter to do their job. And having already connected a few of the dots, the Nottingham Evening Post went with Second beauty, slain in London. The story of French Fifi was as dead and buried as her body. But now, they had a reason to remember her. New flat riddle for Scotland Yard. Is there a link with stocking crime? Both victims strangled and French. Overnight, the unremarkable deaths of two forgotten women had gained notoriety. But only because their murders had sex, death, mystery, and a faceless killer who stalked the shadows. Focused on speed rather than accuracy, the press bastardized the facts. Fingerprints of killer found at murder only they actually belonged to the first PC on the scene. Police took away blood-stained door, which was wrong as the pool of blood about her nose hadn't splashed nor spread. 
and £14 pounds found in cupboard. Which was entirely false, as according to Carlo, nothing was missing. Not even a penny. The very next day, the Evening Standard quoted Superintendent Walter Hambrook as stating, This case cannot be associated with the ordinary class of murder, which in the minds of the newspapers and its readers put the deaths of Marie Cotton and French Fifi upon a pedestal. The problem was, he never said those words. But if you print it, it becomes fact. And the more you repeat it, it becomes proof. The death of Marie Cotton would have been as unremarkable as it was forgotten. And yet as gossip brewed, a myth about a strangler in Soho began to stir. As the word murder rippled with unstoppable speed about the West End. As often happens, theories as to the culprit spread, and the usual bigoted band of society's villains were blamed, like gays, Jews, foreigners, bohemians, the insane and the disabled, with those always choosing to believe it was them and never us. Every witness had a theory as to who had done it. But just like the crime scene, the police were methodical. Although Josephine Pulican would state, I feel certain she was murdered by Mr. Lanza. He is a brute and often kicked Madame Cotton, as did Remo. Carlo Lanza was seen by many reliable independent witnesses at his place of work during the hours she died. As was Remo, his son, who found the body, as well as Dintis, her lover, who Dorothy described as a dangerous man. His movements were accounted for. Last in alive by her lodger, Dorothy Neary, who was having sex in her room a few feet away with her Jewish boyfriend when Marie was murdered. Neither were suspected as culprits. And as her ex-husband was dead, and the mysterious Mr. Cohen could not be proven to have ever existed, the police toyed with other theories, such as chance encounter, a secret in her past, a failed burglary, or that living on the same floor as a Soho prostitute, that her death was a case of mistaken identity. All of these theories were examined, but dismissed, as the police had a prime suspect. It's hard to pin down who he was, as he riddled his life with so many lies. To some he was from Yorkshire, but to others he said he was from Norfolk. He said he was an orphan, only his mum was still alive and his dad had only just died. And although many called him Jimmy, Graham and even Peter Graham, three aliases he was known to use to hide his crimes. His real name was James Allen Hall. Born in 1907 in Shelton, a parish 12 miles south of Norwich. His father was an innkeeper. His mother was a housewife. He had one older sister called Dora and to keep the coffers coming in, a lodger. Branded as unruly and selfish, what sparked his aggression is unknown. As although educated, 
he would stumble into petty thievery to fund a lifestyle of drink, fashion and sexual experimentation. On an unknown date in the late 1920s, James married May, making her Mrs. May Janet Hall. How they met and why they wed is a mystery, as with misery pervading their home, he only married her to hide the truth, and drinking heavily, he often assaulted her. In 1931, May applied for a divorce. But before her solicitors could issue him with the papers, he had already fled to London. Being on the run, James worked as an assistant clerk to his father at the Southgate Burial Board in North London, processing monies for plots and gravestones of the recently bereaved. In early 1933, he had fraudulently cashed two cheques totaling £59, or £4,500 today. As was his habit when things got hot. Before he could be arrested, he fled, leaving his widowed mother to fend for herself. He hunkered down in lodging houses. He hid under aliases. He racked up debts and being booted out for misbehavior, lewd acts and drunkenness. He always left a trail of destruction. Drink, sex, violence and money. Four words which were hardly the calling card of the Soho Strangler. A killer so calm and controlled that he never left a single witness nor piece of evidence as to his identity. But then again, maybe as a fledgling killer finding his feet, his lack of capture was as much down to luck as it was to his cunning. In the spring of 1935, James worked as a clerk at Denard Manufacturing, a gown manufacturer at 65 Margaret Street in nearby Fitzrovia. On the 3rd of October 1935, having interviewed 20 applicants for an intern role, with all being young, slim boys, he hired 18-year-old Donald Ross, the one he fancied most. Donald would state, I wasn't corrupted until I met Hall. Staying at James's lodging at the Trafalgar at 37 Craven Terrace, I agreed to stay and slept with him in one bed. He did not attempt to interfere with me, Donald would state. But with the landlady objecting to two men sharing a bed, James went in search of a new lodging. On the 15th of November 1935, James spotted an advert in a newsagent's window. Single room, £1.7 shillings a week, plus room cleaned and sheets washed. J. Lanza, 47 Lexington Street. It was affordable, discreet, and with Soho having a long history of tolerance towards homosexuals, this could be their little love nest. Moving in the next day, the small front room was furnished with a dresser, a table, a bucket as a toilet, and a thick double mattress with fresh bed sheets every two weeks. For the money, it was comfortable. And although they had to share a bathroom, Donald would state, we did not get food in the house, 
as they had no access to the landlady's kitchen. According to those who were there, James Hall, the lodger, got on well with Jean-Marie Cotton, the landlady. She was quiet and didn't bother them. He paid on time and rarely spoke to her. Donald would state, I never heard him have any quarrels with her, nor did I hear him ever threaten her in any way. As a moral woman who didn't like his immoral ways, in private to Dorothy, she would openly call them Nancy boys. Just as in private to Donald, he would lambast her as the bitch on Lexington Street. It was no secret that they weren't on friendly terms. But that was hardly a solid motive to murder her. As suspects go, compared to Carlo, her violent partner, Dintis, her absconding lover, or the mysterious Mr. Cohen, a man so threatening that he had made her physically shake, James Hall hardly fits the bill. He could be the Soho Strangler, given that he lived near or with each victim, although others did too. Given that he had a history of violence against women, but only against his wife, and given that he used aliases and short-term lodgings, and yet who wouldn't if they were on the run for check fraud? If he was the Soho Strangler, maybe these murders were merely failed robberies. Maybe he did them in a drunken haze. Maybe he had a split personality. Maybe they weren't sexually assaulted as James was gay. Or maybe it's just a coincidence that both victims were small, mid-40s French brunettes. James was the most unlikely suspect in the search for the Soho Strangler. He wasn't a punter, a pimp, a ponce, a white slaver, a gang member, a foreigner, a stranger, or as the press's chief suspect, a Jew. And yet, the police hadn't got it wrong. They weren't searching for a serial strangler stalking Soho sex workers. They were simply seeking the most likely suspect in the murder of John Marie Cotton. And that was James Allen Hall. James was a despicable man. A violent drunk, a selfish thug and the kind of callous thief who had no qualms about stealing funeral funds from bereaved widows. And as the police would suspect, an arrogant man who could take the life of an innocent person over something entirely pointless and trivial. Barely any of which made it into the press as being gay an outcast who was blamed for corrupting society. His real crime was his sexuality. As every reported detail of his life was tagged with the words lewd, depraved, sick and disgusting. Although if you were to ask French Fifi and Marie Cotton what deeds their staunchly heterosexual partners or punters did to them, I'm sure foul would be a fine word. Sadly, this is a reflection of the era, as the police investigation also focused heavily on James's sexual activities. Even though the Soho Strangler killings of both Fifi and Marie had no sexual motive. When 18-year-old Donald Ross was interviewed about his relationship with 28-year-old James Hall, the police flagged up buggery, masturbation, and added, there is an abundance of evidence to prove that Hall is a sodomite. 
a few days after they moved in, James invited the kilted soldier back to the room. Donald would state, I saw them both in bed. Hall said to me, I have brought a lady home tonight for a treat. The kilted soldier was naked. I saw Hall and the soldier holding and rubbing each other's persons. He had an unnatural connection with me of my back passage about half a dozen times. It may not seem likely that James Hall was the Soho Strangler. But regarded as a deviant, it took no leap for society to assume that any gay sadist had an appetite for strangulation, even of women. So putting the Soho Strangler aside for a second, was James Hall a killer? Or as Marie's murder had no other suspects, Fifi's had gone unsolved. And with the press's readers feverishly baying for blood, had the police simply bagged themselves a very convenient scapegoat? A few days before the 30th of January 1936, while Marie was cleaning James's room, she spotted stains on the bed caused by excretia, semen and Vaseline. Not wanting to cause any fuss, she left a note. Donald would state, Mrs. Lanza spoke to me about this matter. She was not upset with me, and as far as I know, she was not unpleasant to Mr. Hall. Dates vary, but on Saturday the 8th of February, James quit the lodging. And as a very literal dirty protest against his landlady's perceived intolerance, with her nose wrinkling in disgust each time he called his boy, darling or sweetheart, James took the half-full bucket of pea and plop and tipped it over the fresh sheets. Angry and disgusted, she didn't want to fight or to take it any further. What she wanted was the two pound and ten shillings as a rightful compensation for damages. Aided by her new lodger, Dorothy Neary, on Tuesday the 17th of March 1936 at 6pm, Marie ascended the stairs to the third floor of 65 Margaret Street in Fitzrovia, where James worked at Denard Manufacturing. As the office was shut, she slipped a little note under the door, which he later stated, annoyed me. Hoping to resolve it amicably, they communicated by letter. But as James had no intention of paying, treating her request with absolute disdain, it soon became a game of cat and mouse. Thursday the 19th of March, James wrote, Dear Madam, I am sorry I was not able to call, but business made this impossible. As regards this evening, I already have made plans. Perhaps you could call me tomorrow night at 6pm when I shall be in. But to call before that time will be of no use as I shall be out on business. Hoping this will be convenient, yours faithfully, J. Hall. She called, but he was out. Saturday the 21st of March. Dear Madam, if you let me know the amount, I will see what I can do in the next few days. I enclose an envelope for your reply, as it is useless to keep calling me. As soon as I hear from you, 
I will give this matter my immediate attention. Yours faithfully, J. Hall. She did, only he didn't. Sunday the 22nd of March. Marie replied, Dear Mr. Hall, Owing to your own arrangements, I have lost two evenings of work. I shall not waste any more time over this matter. And having already threatened to take it further, on Thursday the 26th of March, she wrote, Dear Mr. Hall, Seeing you have not kept your word, will you kindly call and see me as soon as you can? If not, I shall take it to court. For anyone else, a soiled mattress would amount to a minor misdemeanor and a paltry fine. But as he was on the run from one set of solicitors seeking to issue him a divorce petition for violent conduct and a second set for the criminal charge of embezzlement, any court action risked his imminent arrest. Unwisely, having chosen to pay her nothing, on Thursday the 9th of April, the same day that Marie was shaken by the fear of the mysterious Jew who hunted her, known only as Mr. Cohen, Marie and Dorothy handed in an application for the summons of James Allen Hall a Great Marlborough Street Police Court. Thursday the 16th of April 1936 was Marie Cotton's last day alive. From 7am onwards, she was seen by several witnesses having an unremarkable day with her last seen at 5.15pm when Dorothy took a bath and left Marie washing and cleaning in her unlocked kitchen. From 9pm till 5pm, James would state that he was at work. Her time of death was between 5.30 and 7.30pm, but no one saw him on Lexington Street at all that night. And yet he was never more than a few streets away. At 6.40 p.m., Leonard Thays met James at the Angel and Crown pub on Warwick Street in St. James's. And from that point onwards, he was seen in several pubs until he returned to his lodgings at the Trafalgar. Those who drank with him said he seemed his normal self, not upset, disheveled, fearful or anxious. There was nothing suspicious about James's actions on the day of the murder. And yet the following day smacks of a man living in fear. The morning of Friday the 17th of April 1936 was deathly still. As a damp fog hung low, and an excitable crowd hung their head in silence. A small black coffin was mournfully carried into the back of a black van. At about the same time, James opened the doors of Denard Manufacturing before anyone was even in and wrote himself four cheques, all in the name of his employer, totaling 13 pounds, 14 shillings and sixpence, almost £1,100 today. With the cheques cashed, James fled. His employer was alerted. CID issued his description. Posters were put up seeking a ruddy-faced 28-year-old wanted for fraud. And having found Leonard Thays in his list of known associates, as James had written to him whilst he was serving in Wandsworth Prison, on the 24th of April, James was tracked down to the Sutherland Public House on Vigo Street and was arrested.
But did he flee because of the court summonses? Or because he was guilty of murder? On the 29th of June, 1936, James Allen Hall was tried at the Old Bailey. Found guilty, he was sentenced to 12 months hard labor for six counts of embezzlement. Delayed for three months, the inquest into the death of Jean-Marie Cotton was resumed on the 9th of June 1936 at Westminster Coroner's Court. With her cause of death certified as ligature strangulation, Dr. John Taylor, the pathologist, stated, strangulation could not have been self-inflicted. With police divisional surgeon, Dr. Charles Burney, confirming there is no suggestion of her having been hanged. Police had identified two indentations on the side of the bed and cigarette ash, which pointed strongly to someone having entered the flat who knew her. But with no fingerprints, no witnesses, no clues, and no confession by the police's prime suspect. Although Superintendent Hambrook would state, Hall gave a most unfavorable impression in the mind of the jury. Nothing, however, is capable of proof against anybody so far as murder is concerned. And the crime is a complete mystery. The coroner, Mr. Ingleby Oddy, would conclude, the only person whom it may be said had a grievance against her is Hall. His grievance against her is not a very serious one. And hers against him is not a very grave one. That provides a very inadequate motive. And with the evidence slim and circumstantial, the inquest was closed, James was dismissed, and the death of Jean-Marie Cotton was listed as murder by person or persons unknown. With two women murdered over five months across a few streets in Soho and with no clear motive or suspects, the police were at a loss as many accused them of grasping at straws. With no answers to the question, how safe are we? A panic began to spread as the sinister idea of a serial killer stalking Soho streets had been planted in the eye of the public, the press, and its readers. In its day, Jack the Ripper was not an instant sensation, as some of his early victims were dismissed as merely unremarkable events or one-off incidents of fallen women, many of whom would be forgotten. And yet all it took to create a sensation was a panic, another murder, and a name for the pieces to be put together. Three streets east, and three weeks after the murder of Marie Cotton, the Soho Strangler would strike again. This time, another prostitute in Soho, strangled to death by an unseen stranger in her own bed. But whereas, although the deaths of Fifi and Marie were initially mistaken as a suicide and an accident, owing to how serene the crime scene had seemed, this next attack could not be confused with anything but a horrifying murder, as the walls, the floor and the door would be saturated and dripping in his victim's blood. Had the killer lost his usual cool and composure? Had his mania given him a taste for blood? Or with the press having almost ignored his two previous murders? Did this serial killer 
crave a public's attention. By May 1936, only one man was on the people's lips, and his name was the Soho Strangler. Part 5 of 10 of the Soho Strangler continues next week.